For the past several weeks, we have been talking about the great decisions of life. And we talked about who's going to be our Lord. Is it going to be self? Or is it going to be our profession, our job, our, our family? And then the Bible reminds us that we're to love the Lord, the Lord, with all of our heart and with all of our mind and with all of our soul and all of our strength. And then we talked about of the life that we're going to live, the life that is an abundant life, a life that God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, has given to us. And we choose to live that type of life. Then we talked about the legacy, the legacy that we will leave behind and the kind of uh, legacy that our children and our children's children and children will follow. And then, of course, we talked about these different decisions that we are having to make. Today, we're going to talk about something else. And when I know that when I approach this subject, people are a lot like they're in a hotel. That when I began to talk about money, they check out on me. <laughs> well, I don't want you to check out on me because I want you to see today through the scriptures of God's plan and God's way of grace giving. And so I ask the question and the decision that we will make, what do we do with our possessions? And every one of us are confronted with that decision because we all have possessions. But what do we do with them? Well, I'm finding in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus Christ has said much about giving. In fact, he talked about giving probably more than any other thing. And that is because we all relate to money. We have to have money to survive. And so money is very, very important in our life. And our possessions are very, very important. And how we handle that will make a major impact upon not only us, but for eternity. I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to turn with me, if you would please, and First uh, Corinthians chapter 9. And I want you to notice with me, Second Corinthians, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 9. And I want you to notice with me several, several things. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but there is a spiritual malady that I have found in the church today. It was discovered 35 A.D., and it was called cirrhosis of the giver. And there was a man and a woman by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. They discovered it. And it's a strange malady. It, it, it somehow or another, it immobiles or keeps that hand from moving from the wallet to the offering plate. And what's so strange about it, you don't see that anywhere else. You don't see it at the golf club. 
You don't see it in the uh, supermarket. You don't see it in the department store or in the restaurant. You don't see that malady. But somehow, some reason, you see it in the local church. And when I began to think about that, I began to think about there's got to be a cure for that. And then I discovered there is. A cure, number one, either salvation or revival cures that malady. It always does. You know, there's all kinds of seminars of how to get. Uh, There's the seminar of how to get rich. And then, of course, as you uh, take that seminar, they will give you uh, a number of principles that if you will do this, for example, in real estate, that if you'll do this and this and this and this, that you will become rich. And then, of course, there are those that says that If you want to become healthy and strong, there is that, uh, those are those machines that will help you become strong and healthy. And then there are those seminars of how to get, uh, be successful. And if you'll take those, uh, take that seminar of doing this and doing that, uh, encouraging your self-esteem and the confidence that you have to be able to display yourself in the uh, corporate world, you can become successful. Well, I want you to understand the Bible is very clear how to become successful in your spiritual life. And one of the ways is your spiritual giving. Let's look at what the Bible has to say. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, and we're going to begin looking at that. So let's look at these first 15 verses. Would you stand with me? as we read these passages of scriptures. Now, notice what the Apostle Paul says. Now, concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, the Achaia, was ready a year ago, and your zeal had stirred up the majority. Yet, I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it's necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Now, did you hear what he said there? He said, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But look at verse 6. I've got this underlined. This is something that my dad shared with me when I was a young boy. He said, or in this scripture says, but this I say, 
He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Isn't that amazing? If you want to know God, if God loves you, are you a cheerful giver? If you're a cheerful giver, I promise you, God loves you in a matter like you have never imagined. Amen. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food Supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men and by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. And then he concludes with this verse of Scripture, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know who he's talking about. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, oh, how precious we are able to come before you today and just acknowledge your presence and to know that as the Scripture has taught us at a young age, for God so loved the world, he gave. He gave the very best, his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Father, I thank you for the gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you that you are so good and that you have blessed us beyond measure. And yet, Lord, you have reminded us of our responsibilities and the decisions that we make and how we handle our possessions will describe our spiritual wall probably more than anything else. And so help us, dear Lord, to be faithful, obedient, to your word, and to give as you have given. And may we will sow that seed that others might be able to be blessed by that seed. In Jesus we pray, amen. When I look at this passage of Scripture, I'm reminded of what Paul was talking to us about, not necessarily the why we give, but the what we give. And as we think about the what, we think about the wherefore, the giving. And so, as I look at this passage of Scripture, it excites me for two reasons. 
Number one, it excites me that he is showing the church of Corinth that they should be in participation of giving. But not only does he show them how, how they should give, but he also shows us of how a pastor should relate to his congregation in giving. Now, I always realize that as a pastor or anybody begins to talk about money or talk about giving, that uh, some people, as I said, they check out on you. But I don't want you to check out on me. I want you to see the blessings that God wants to instore upon you through your giving. Because there are blessings that will come in your life that will not come in any other way except by response to your giving. Right. So, what the Apostle Paul does, he lays down several principles. And I want you to write these down. First of all, I want you to notice of what Paul does. He just simply reminds them of their giving. He just reminds them. He doesn't browbeat them. He doesn't twist their arms. He doesn't call them names. He just simply reminds them of their responsibility. Look what he says in verse 1. Now, concerning the ministering to the saints, it's superfluous for me to write to you. Now, let me give you a little background of this chapter. The church of Jerusalem, which was made up of Jewish Christians, had fallen upon hard times. There in Judea, recession had hit, inflation had gone wild, and, and financially, there in Jerusalem, they were struggling. I mean struggling. And because of that, the church of Jerusalem was struggling as well. And there were many, many needs within that church. They were giving to the poor. They were giving to those that were in need. And they were not able to do that any longer because that financially the bottom had fallen out. But the church at Corinth, the church at Corinth was made up of Greeks and Gentile Christians. And they were flourishing. Corinth was a metropolitan city, and it was a trading city. People would come from all around the countries to come to Corinth, and there they would trade. And so financially, they were doing very, 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 very well. And because of that, the church of Corinth was doing very well. Well, the church of Corinth had gotten when that the church of Jerusalem had a need. And they made a promise a year ago that they were going to give them a gift. And not only a gift, but a bountifully gift. In other words, going to give a, them a very large, large gift. And so what had happened, a year had gone by, and I don't know what happened, but it seems as if that the church of Corinth had forgotten their promise, and they had not given that gift. And so what Paul does in a gentle manner, a very loving way, he just reminds them of their promise and reminds them of their responsibility. Now, I think that when there's churches in need, 
that other churches should come along beside them and try to help them. We're all a part of the family of God, and we're all a part of the family of this church. So when our church has a need, you should recognize your responsibility of meeting that need. And our church does have responsibilities. As we think about our church, we think about the ministries of our church. And and when those needs are not met, those ministries are not able to be met. And so, therefore, as being a part of the church body, and the church family of Kentsville Baptist Church, if you're a member of this church, you have a responsibility. Now, there might be some reason that you have not been able to fulfill that responsibility in the past as your pastor, as your shepherd, lovingly but also boldly. I'm reminding you of your responsibility. I'm not going to stand up here and browbeat you. I'm not going to stand up here and to uh, twist your arm or anything of that nature. That is not my character. If If you've been attending this church, you know I hardly ever mention money. I hardly ever preach on it. I probably should preach on it more than I do. But I have a responsibility as your shepherd to remind you of your responsibility. Now, I'm not going to do like what I heard about one time about this guy. This preacher were in a building program. And um, there was one particular man in his church very, very wealthy man. He wouldn't even attend church, much less give money to the church. Well, there was an older feller in the church had gotten wind of this. So he came to the pastor one day, and he said, Pastor, he said, I know old so-and-so. He don't attend church, and he hadn't given a dime to the building fund. He said, with your permission... I'll get him to start attending, and I'll get him to give the largest uh, uh, offering that has ever been given. Preacher thought, well, I don't know how you're going to do that, but yes, you have my permission. Well, he goes by the uh, pastor to to his secretary, and he gets some stationery from the church. Well, about five days later, the pastor receives a registered letter from this very wealthy individual of the church. To his surprise, the letter said, Pastor, I know I've been negligent in attending church, but this Sunday I will be there, and from Sunday on I will be there every single Sunday. And not only that, I'm going to give $100,000 to the building program. Pastor said, thought, man, that is wonderful. But he thought, what in the world caused this man to do this? And then he continued reading the letter. And there it had a P.S., And it says, would you tell your secretary that there's only one T in dirty and no C in skunks? (laughs) Well, we're not going to send out those kinds of letters. But it worked for that individual. The Apostle Paul, he is just simply reminding the church of Corinth about their promise. Second of all, I want you to notice with me about the reputation that he was concerned about. He was concerned more about the reputation of the church of Corinth than he was about the money. I want you to notice several passages of Scripture of how he had boasted about the generosity of the church of Corinth. 
Notice in chapter 8, verse 24, he speaks about he, our boasting on your behalf. And then down in verse 2, he says, For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians. And then he says in verse 3, Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain. And then one more time in verse 4, he says, Be ashamed of this confident boasting. The church had boasted for a year that they were going to give to the church of Jerusalem, and they were going to give generously. Boasted over and over and over and over again. I think what the Apostle Paul must have done, he was reminded of the book of Proverbs when he wrote these words. Listen to what it says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1. Whoever falsely, uh, no, excuse me, he says, a good name is to be chosen above riches. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1. And then in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 14, he says, whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. In other words, their reputation was at stake that they had a responsibility and they were not fulfilling that responsibility. He concludes in verse 5, listen to this. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your bountiful gift beforehand which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Now, if you know anything about the church of Corinth, you know that this church was not a perfect church. It had its problems. It had its trouble. In fact, the Apostle Paul probably had more problems out of the church of Corinth than any other church that he had ever been connected with. But there was one thing about the church of, of Corinth that he could say. They were a generous church. They were a church that gave liberally. Now, as a generous church, they had promised not only a gift, the Apostle Paul said, but a bountiful gift. Now, you know, when I think about that, I think in our society, in our churches today, we need to stop emphasizing of how much a person makes and start emphasizing how much they give. When I was in, in Korea several years ago, I found something interesting. I found out in the foyer of the church, they had several pages listing of all the church members. And they put on those pages how much they gave that year. Wow. <laughs> Somebody asked me, said, Pastor, you going to go home and do that? I said, I don't want to be run off from the church. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, hey, listen. The emphasis is not on how much you make. The emphasis is how much you give. And so as he looks at this, 
You need, you need to realize that there's no reward of being rich. You're not going to get a special prize to, when you get to heaven because you made a lot of money. But my friend, there are rewards of how much you give when you get to heaven. And so we need to look at things a lot different. The Bible says in verse 2, your zeal has stirred up the majority. In other words, he says, by your example, it has encouraged others. Oh, I believe he's talking about other churches. I believe he is talking about other Christians. By your example that you give encourages. Did you know, mom and dad, by your example, it will encourage your children when they grow up to give? Right. By your example, it will encourage not only your children, but your grandchildren. What you are doing, you're leaving that legacy of importance and recognizing the importance of supporting the needs of that local church. So what the Apostle Paul does, he reminds us of our responsibility. And then he talks about not only the reminder, but he talked about the reputation that they have. And then thirdly, he gives us some reasons why we should give. Why should I give? I mean, after all, others can take care of the responsibility. Why should I have to give? Well, listen what the Bible says in verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You know what? I think we got our terminology all messed up. When we give, we call that contribution. In other words, at the end of the year, uh, you will get what is called as a contribution statement. And there we'll have the listing of how and when you gave certain amounts of money to the church. I think we need to change the name from contribution to investment. You're not contributing, but you're investing. You are investing in the Word of God and in the work of God when you give. And so I think that when we have a change of attitude uh, and a change of understanding that when I give, I am investing in lives. I'm investing in souls. I'm investing that the message of the gospel will go forward. I am investing in missionaries to go around the world. I am investing. So when you change your attitude, I think it will change your giving. And so that's exactly what Paul is talking about. Did you realize what God does? He operates on grace. You think about it. Everything that God does is because of grace. He sustains us. He secures us. As you think about that grace, you begin to realize that God's plan of economy is on grace. Therefore, God's economy is through the grace of God. I'm able to make the money that I make. I'm able to have 
the, 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 the possessions that I have, it's because of God's grace and his goodness upon my life. So, think about God's bank of grace. It's all completely different than our banks that we have in our world today. Because in the world today, when you write a check and that check goes to your bank account, what happens? Your balance is deducted of that particular amount. But did you realize in God's bank of grace, First National Bank of Grace, that is not deducted, but is added. That when you give, you're not deducting, but you're adding. For example, let me give you uh, uh, a couple of examples. You want uh, friends? What do you do? You become a friend. And as you become a friend, you experience friendship. You want someone to love you. You begin to love someone else. And as you love, you're giving out to the bank of grace. And instead of deducting there is that increase of love that people will love you back. And so disbursement among the earthly banks is entirely different than it when it comes to the bank of grace. That's why he says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 and following, there is one who scatters yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. And then he goes and he says, the generous soul will, may, will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. You want happiness? Make sure someone else become happy. And by their happiness, you receive happiness. John Bunyan made this statement one time. A man there was, and they called him mad. The more he gave, the more he had. And I believe that is so true. The more he gave, the more he had. There was this wealthy individual. that he gave millions and millions of dollars away every year. And somebody said to him, I don't understand it. How can you give so much away and yet have so much? He saw it's very simple. As I shovel out, God shovels in. And the difference is, his shovel was bigger than mine. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. The more I shovel out, the more God shovels in. Some people wonder why they're struggling financially. My friend, look at your giving. The more you shovel out, I believe the more God shovels in. And so the Apostle Paul reminds them of the reasons for their giving. But then I want you to notice the rules for giving. He lays down a couple of rules. Listen to what, how he does this. See, 
So often, we're so concerned with the what of our giving when God is concerned with the way and the why we give. First of all, he says, give thoughtfully. Look what he says in verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Friend, I want you to understand, giving is serious. Giving should not be done careless. It should not be done thoughtless. But it should be done very thoughtful and prayerful. Some people give just whatever comes, uh, a number comes into their mind. Some people give of, Boy, they think everybody else should give. But did you realize you are an individual? And as an individual, you have certain amount of income and possessions. And it's different from anybody else. And so therefore, God says, you need to set down A husband and a wife should prayerfully, thoughtfully make the decision together what you should give. I'm amazed of how so many people want to give the bare minimum. I have had people before come to me. I can't tell you how many people have asked me, Now, pastor, should I give from the gross or the net? My answer and my response is always this. What do you want God to bless you with, your gross or your net? Quit trying to figure out what's the minimum. I've had seen people look at, well, I'm going to give my 10%, and it's down to the, to the particular penny. And they'll write their ties out to that particular penny instead of rounding it off. And you know what's amazing to me? I, I, I never figured this out. We don't have a problem of going to a, a restaurant and giving 20% tip. But when we come to the house of God, we have a problem giving God 10%. I've never figured that out. Some people think they can do more with 100% than God can with 90%. So, He says, do it thoughtfully. But look what he says in verse 7 also. Do it willfully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Grudgingly is the, the Greek word that we get out of pain. I give, but boy, it's out of pain grudgingly, out of necessity, under compulsion, feeling forced that you have to give because the pastor expects you to give. No. Don't give because of what I expect. Give what God expects and what the Word of God says. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the postman of sharing with you of what God says. See, there's three types of givers. There are those that are the grudging giving. There are those that are the guilt giving. And then there are those that are the grateful giving. Classify yourself. Grudgingly give because I have to. Because I have to. The Bible says I got to give, and so I guess I have to give. 
Some give because they feel guilty. My friend, I don't want you to give because you feel guilty. I don't know if you know this or not. God doesn't really need your money. God has gotten along just fine without you and your money. It's not that God needs your money. You're needing God's grace. You're needing his blessings. And so you give willfully, and then you give cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful is the Greek word hilarious. And when you give, you're just hilarious. Woo! <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if we pass the offering plate around and all you hear, woo! Oh, this is biblical. Love's a cheerful giver. And then closing very quickly, the results of our giving. He says, first of all, though it's the result of grace, he says in verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. Hear that? sufficiency in some things. No, that's not what he said. In all things may have an abundance of every good work. I believe, I believe with all my heart because I've experienced it. When you give God will supply every need that you have. Maybe not your wants, but he will supply every need that you have. And you will not go lacking if you do it accordingly, cheerfully. And there the second result is gratitude. Look what he says in verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes what? Thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. You know what grace does? It always leads you to gratitude. It always leads you to gratitude. I want to ask you something. Are you grateful? Are you grateful for what God has given to you and done for you? Well, my friend... I think if we're grateful, there will be that spirit of gratitude of giving. That every good and perfect gift comes from above. And that what I have in my possessions is His. And that I open my hand fully and say, God, this is not my home. God, this is not my automobile. This is not my job. This is not my family. This is not my possessions. But they're yours. And you've loaned them to me. And you've asked me 
to be a steward of that. And I want to be a good steward. I want the fields to harvest bountifully. And so if I know anything about farming, if I plant just one or two seeds, I'm only going to reap just a little. But if I plant many seeds, many seeds, the more I plant, the more the harvest. And it's greater than what I planted. More than I ever thought I had in my hand. And then closing, the third result is glory. The church will be edified and God will be glorified. That's what it's all about, people. It's what it's all about. Someone made a statement one time. I could hardly believe this, but yet I realize it's true. Out of all the churches in the Southern Baptist Convention, only an average of two and a half percent giving of their income from the memberships of the churches. An average. Now that grieves me to think that the average church member would only give two and a half percent of their income. Ron Blue said this, and I'll never Forget this as I, I read it. He said, if you would take, if you would take all the churches and put everybody on welfare and they tithe, the income would double in our churches. The income would double. So, am I bigger than God? Can I, am I more powerful than the Lord? Can I do more with what I've got than God can? Of course, the answer is no. So, God has called us to be sold. And it's up to you. It's up to you whether you want to reap bountifully or not. So I'm not here to browbeat you. Not here to shame you. I'm not here to point fingers. I don't know what people give. I never look. But I do believe with all my heart that our offering should be a whole lot more than what they are for the size of our congregation. So right now, I'm just asking the Lord to speak to your heart. I don't want you to give grudgingly. I don't want you to feel that you've been coerced. But with a free heart, a love that is indescribable, that God has given his only begotten son so that we in return may follow likewise.